I think he gives dreams. And God's dreams aren't pipe dreams. God's dreams are dreams that can become reality. God gave me a dream a long time ago. I've always had a heart for the church. Even when I was going from church to church and made stupid statements about not wanting ever to be a pastor, I still had a love for the church. I've always loved the church. I've seen, I've seen awful things passing for church. I've seen people treat each other terribly. I've unfortunately witnessed some pastors fall from grace. Some of them were my friends and still are. But even with all of that, I love the church. And here's the thing that stands out at me so much lately. We have no idea. We have no idea the effect we can have on this sinful world if we just get over ourselves and say yes, yes. A handful of people, 120 people in the upper room on the day of Pentecost changed the world in no time. Trouble came in Jerusalem and persecution came. And they didn't let it stop them. It made them leave. And when they left, they took the gospel message. I have a feeling sometimes today in our country, if there, if there arises real persecution, there's going to be an awful lot of people who call themselves followers of Jesus that are going to shrink back and say, well, it's all over. I guess we can't do this anymore. It should have exactly the opposite effect. Man, I'm telling you, we, it, the potential in this room is unbelievable in God's eyes. Unbelievable. The potential in this town this morning with people who are gathered in the name of Jesus is just unbelievable. There's no man-made weapon on earth that has that much power. God forgive us if we just sit in our comfortable pew and refuse to get out of our comfort zone. We have everything we need right here, right here to make an impact for eternity. Hallelujah. And I'm so thankful when I see people just say, that's it. I'm, I'm throwing off all this stuff, and I'm going to passionately serve him with all my heart and all my life. Right. And, and this pew right here is filled with young people. Sound like an old man when I say that. <laughs> young people? <laughs> Maybe I am, huh? Potential right here is incredible. Amen. Potential right over here. God has given us younger people to train, and that's why we're teaching them the Bible. That's why we're trying to get them involved in experiences like this, and I'm just so glad. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking more later, so I'll shut up, and uh, we'll let the kids go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, team. Brother Dan, thank you so much. We are really blessed to have people here that uh, just pick up the ball when it needs picked up. Thank you for that. Thank you for, for Faye, and we missed Jim today, but we, we put him in the mix just the same. And uh, so thankful for those people that stand on a platform. I'm thankful for their singing abilities, but I'm more thankful for their hearts. You can have the greatest singing voice or, or uh, be able to play instruments. You can be the greatest in the world and not have any effect. It's the anointing. It's the anointing. Amen? Amen. So, um, we got a video. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Extraordinary men and women went before us with unmatched resilience, enduring hardship, when called upon to defend and liberate, they said yes. They found courage to rise with every son, loyalty toward their country, discipline for every command, 
even in the darkest hours? They said, yes. They cherish and fought for freedom, so those coming behind them were assured of it. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be rid, they said, yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor them. Saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. To give yourself to something bigger than yourself. That's exactly what they did. And there are people today that are doing that in all walks of life, whether that be in the armed forces or the missionaries that leave culture, language, and familiarity behind and go where God is leading them. So we honor our missionaries today too as well. Most of us have somebody in our family lineage who not only served in the U.S. military, but perhaps didn't come home. If we don't have a direct relative, we have a friend or uh, maybe a distant family member. And uh, we never can forget that because they gave themselves to something greater than themselves. And one way that we can emulate them is to give ourselves to what God wants us to do, to consider that person sitting next to you this morning in the pew, to consider them above your own uh, thoughts, your own desires, your own needs, and to live selflessly for one another. Um, this, this life isn't going to last that long in the, in the span of eternity. Wouldn't it be good to know that someday you'll be able to spend eternity with people that you chose to bless instead of blessing yourself. I don't know how many, uh, how many racing fans do we have here today? Any NASCAR fans? Yeah, we've got a few. Yeah. <laughs> My son, Alex, is a huge NASCAR fan. He and uh, some buddies have a podcast called Racing Addicts. So, Go to where you get your podcast and look up Racing Addicts. Really professionally done. It's almost like he knows audio and video and stuff. But um, uh, matter of fact, he and his bride are in Charlotte as we speak. She is so gracious to him. And she is something else. She, she not only lets him go every so often, she goes with him. So they both took a little time off from work. And uh, they're down there today and coming home tomorrow, and as far as I know, it hasn't rained yet. Seems like every place he goes to a racetrack, rain follows him, so we're starting to make comments. But he really got into racing just about the time that Dale Earnhardt Sr. was killed. I think that was 2001, which would have made him about 11. So he's, he's, been, uh, he's been a fan for a long time. Well, those of you who are racing fans know that there's two rules to follow. Turn left, go fast, right? <laughs> Turn left and go fast. Those are the main rules that you have to follow. And you go around this track, depending on what size track it is, and you see the same scenery every single time, but it's always a little different. Depends what position you're in, who you're trying to get around, are you high, are you on the inside? So it's the same track, but it always looks a little different. So the drivers will prepare, especially on a new track or in a freshly paved track, they go in early and they do their time trials and all that, but a lot of that is to get them familiar with the track. Because if you come in to a brand new place, you've got to understand what it's going to do to you, right? So they come and they prepare so that they're ready to go. Sounds like life, doesn't it? Maybe the most important lessons are what not to do. And I think for a driver on a NASCAR track, they're finding out what they can do, how far they can push the car, and what they can't do. And the whole race is learning that over and over again. We're going to look today, this is a completing a sermon series 
on who do you know who to believe, how do you know who to believe, or who do you believe, or whatever I may have called it over the past six weeks. But uh, the idea is that we're taking what John the Apostle wrote in the epistle of John, the first epistle of John, 1 John, and uh, today we're going to be looking in chapter 5 and looking at the first five verses of 1 John. So, much like a racetrack, we're going to be looking at straightaways and the turns in between. Uh, we're, all, we're looking at the same track but we're getting different views as we go around this track. And we're going to uh, correlate that to how we go through our lives and how we live for Jesus and how we experience and get to know what to do, what not to do. And we have some really good advice here as we go through our Christian life from people that walked with Jesus. The Apostle John walked with Jesus. And when he wrote this letter, he had one major thing that he wanted to accomplish— and that was to help young believers stay true to the gospel message. Because there were a group of people that had come into the church and actually had broken free from the church, and they were saying, oh no, we're smarter than the apostles, we've got superior knowledge, and we understand more than they do. And here's John, the last apostle, the only one to live his natural life through, around 85 AD, he's the only one left, and he says, excuse me, I'm over here I was there. So he's going on record and saying, here, you got to be careful as you're going through this track that we're going to call life. When you get to certain turns and you get things that come across your path, let me give you some advice so that you stay true to the real Jesus. So that's what we're doing as we go through this series. In our Christian life, as we mature, and as we grow and as we experience more, we learn and relearn some lessons, right? Mm -hmm. Things that we knew to be true that we thought, well, maybe in this case it's not, and we found out, yeah, it still is. As we learn and relearn lessons, we become closer to Jesus. Not only that, we start to look more like Jesus. We start to live more like Jesus we understand the heart of Jesus, and we seek to be like Him. Put that next picture up. Anybody ever feel? Yep, well, we didn't get there. This guy. <laughs> Have you ever feel like that? You turn on the news, or you see what's on Facebook, or you look at the stuff on different social media platforms and everyone claiming to be an expert. You know, when the platform calls you, costs you nothing to be on, everybody can be an expert. And, but you know what? For the Christian, we don't have to be like this guy. We don't have to, to struggle over this. We can know what to believe when it comes to things of God. We've got 66 books and 1,189 chapters, and it's put together uh, written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 men, and it gives us the, the first 4,000 years of history of the way God revealed Himself, dealt with, forgave, corrected His creation, His prized creation, the one of which God said on the sixth day, not just that it's good, but it's very good. And He loved us so much that He wanted us to be in His image, so He created us with free will. He created us with the ability to love and to choose. And He still wishes, er, does God wish? No. It's still God's plan that we come to Him of our own accord, that we love Him. In our world, there are a lot of people trying to make people do things. That's not God. If He made us do things, He wouldn't be God. Because He created us with free will. We don't have to be like Professor here and wonder what's coming up. There are four sections to what we're going to look at today. It's a lot like a racetrack. Believe, 
love, overcome, and repeat. Believe, love, overcome, repeat. Believe, love, overcome, repeat. And if that sounds monotonous, let me assure you it's anything but boring. But when you understand how we are made to live and how we are made to overcome the things that we face in this life, you realize that God has created a whole lot more uh, potential in us than we ever realize. So in the wrap-up today of this series, this focus, we're going to focus on our relationship with God. We've already done that this morning. We've already spent time, extra time, coming before the throne of God and just giving Him our all. And I praise God for that. And that's a good start. That's a good start. So as we come into these first five verses of chapter five, we're about to get the flag to start the race. And we're going to start the race today with verse one. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. There's a couple of factual statements here that we can uh, use as a litmus test to how we're living our life. Here's, here's the first thing. If you are a believer in Christ, if you've been born again, if you've been transformed, you are a child of God. And, and aside from our willing removal of ourselves from His hand, nobody can take that from you. Nobody. The, the, the civil authorities can't do it. Uh, false teachers can't do it. Your family can't do it. The government can't do it. Even the enemy of your soul can't do it. If you are born again and you're living for Jesus, you are a child of God. And when you're a child of somebody, especially in the, the New Testament context, you have rights and privileges. If you're a child of the king, you're a prince or a princess, right? So if you're a child of God, you have rights and privileges. God looks upon you as if you're a natural born son or daughter. And there's another litmus test in this very first verse. If you love the Father, you'll love His children. So we don't have a choice. If you say you love the Father, then you'll love His children. Who are His children? Well, fellow believers. How do you love them? You want what's best for them. You prefer them over you. You're willing to go the extra mile for a fellow believer. You want them to grow with you, along with you, in your relationship with the Lord. That's how you show that you love them. You want to bless them. You want to comfort them. You want to encourage them. And sometimes you got to challenge them and stretch them just a little bit. Right? Loving children is not always giving them what they want, is it? Our own children. But this is a picture of the way the church is supposed to exists that we love God and we love other people. That's in stark contrast to the world. Out for their themselves, out for number one. I'll step on anybody I have to to get to where I want to be. And you get to the end of the life and you're miserable. What have you really accomplished? Love takes some effort sometimes. It's a desire to live sacrificially. I love my fellow believers so much that I'm willing to sacrifice. But when you do that, you exhibit, exhibit godly character and patience and concern. Are you a child of God today? Do you love God? Then you'll love fellow believers. If you need further clarification about what loving fellow believers look like, let's go to the end of the next turn and look at verse 2. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey His commandments. 
and we're heading into this first turn of the track, right? We have the same track, different view. We're getting a little bit more information about this. We know that we love God's children if we love God and obey His commandments, because His commandments are about our relationship with Him and our relationship with others, right here. Every single one falls into one of those two categories. Our relationship with Him and our relationship with others. Verse 1 said that if you love God, you love His children. Verse 2 says you know that you're loving His children if you love and obey God. Again, we know we love God's children if we love God and obey His commandments. So, what's it mean to obey His commandments? Well, are there some that are more important than others? No one wants to say anything, but I think the answer would have to be yes. First of all, we're not living according to the law. The law is written on our hearts. But Jesus, when He was asked the question, He he basically said, yes, there there are some that are more important. And the Pharisees asked Jesus this question, and they were trying to trap Him when they said, what's the greatest commandment? And He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then he added, there's another one that runs a close second. Love your neighbor as yourself. But really, when you look at it, if you follow the first one, you're going to follow the second. If you're loving the Lord with all of your heart, you are going to love others as well, because that is all part of God's heart. If we're seeking God's heart, we're going to love other people. We're going to love, especially, we're just talking right now of fellow believers. Should be able to love fellow believers. Loving others isn't the same as placating them. The world thinks that uh, a Christian should just be nice all the time. And there are some things that we are against, not people, but sin. We have to stand against things that God's against. Uh, There are times that you can't just give people what they want, but what they need. And loving others is not allowing them to do whatever they want, especially believers. We are to sharpen one another in the body of Christ. We are given permission in the church to make judgments, not on our own wishes, but on what God has already established. That's why we have doctrine. That's why we have points that things that we believe. The Assemblies of God, we have 16 fundamental truths. And that says these are things that that we hold fast to. There's enough that we can disagree on. Here's what we hold fast to. It doesn't make us uncaring or unloving. Quite the opposite. We love others by helping them to understand God's truth. You know, Jesus gave a command to His disciples in John 13. He said, a new command I give you love one another. And I believe that we could paraphrase Jesus without running the risk of putting words in his mouth. That Jesus is saying, you know how I loved you? Love other people the same way. And when you get right down to it, if you understand how Jesus loved us, then we exactly know how to love one another. It's not rocket science. It's just not that complicated. Because loving God is obeying God. And part of obeying God is loving your fellow believer. And now we're heading down the straightaway into the next turn, and it's another repetition. God wants us to get this. And let's look at it. If you believe in Jesus, you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, you'll love His children. And the second part, furthermore, you can be sure that you have, that you are really showing love to His children if you love God and keep His commandments. And in case you're not convinced of this and what God wants for each of us, let's head down to uh, from turn two and then the next straightaway, and we'll go into verse three. Loving God means keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. <laughs> Men have commandments that can be burdensome. And they can be imposed on people. But God's commandments are not burdensome. They're not. We make it difficult 
when we allow our flesh to live. We make it difficult when we reject what God has planned for us, which is for our good, and choose to be our own gods and worship ourselves. But his commandments are not burdensome. Straightforward here. Lest there be any question, loving God means keeping his commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Matthew says that. Mark and Luke add, and strength. So anything you have within you, the ability you have to persevere, if you are, how many know, when you're trying to overcome something, it's hard. How many know, life is hard. Sometimes doing the right thing is hard. Sometimes denying flesh is hard. But you use all your strength to love the Lord your God. Just before Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to his disciples, he told them in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And here John says, and his commandments are not burdensome. God is not out to steal your joy and ruin your party. He's not out to ruin your fun. He's not out to... to make your life miserable. He's not out to keep you back from doing all those things you want to do. That's not God. But He knows better than you do, better than I do, what is for your good or my good. A lot of unbelievers think that following Jesus means all your fun is over. They do. I've met some church people that think that. And I can tell because they're miserable. (laughs) They're miserable and they think that being miserable makes them holy. And it doesn't make them holy. It's joyous, joyless servitude. That's not serving God. That's serving man's made up rules. And it's joyless, and that's not what God wants for us. You serve your religion and your tradition more than you serve God, and you will be just a joyless servant. If you serve your dysfunctional understanding of God, you'll be miserable. But there's a life to be lived beyond all of that. It's a freedom. It's not freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. It's not freedom from the rules. It's, it's freedom to have a heart that wants to follow after God. Yes. And what have we done? We've made it about power and control. Yeah. And we've said, you do this, you do this, you do this. And here's the God of the universe saying, look, I already laid all this out. Right. I gave my very best so that you could have this written on your heart. Like the Pharisees made up more rules just so they could say they followed them. Let's not be Pharisees. The Word of God tells us here, for those who are born again, you're not designed to be overwhelmed by having to be a Christian. You are not designed to be overwhelmed by trying to act like a follower of Jesus. It should be a supernatural result of being transformed continually, not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. His commands are not burdensome for the transformed believer in Jesus Christ. Your heart's desire is to please the Lord. And we head into turn three. This turn has a very steep bank. Many drivers warn other drivers of this one. This is a tough one. This is where some drivers mess up. This is where some lose control. Verse 4, for every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. We would like to read that for some children of God defeat this evil world. John the Apostle walked with Jesus was there at the cross when Jesus died, was the first one to the empty tomb. 
lived his life through, was given that vision from the resurrected Christ that we call the book of Revelation. And he says, every child of God defeats this evil world. Now, in Western Christianity, by and large, not everybody, by and large, this is only achieved politically. Let me explain. By and large, people who are having trouble divorcing politics from what it means to live for Jesus, and there's nothing wrong with politics. The view on this verse is, if there's any evil in the world, we have failed. That the only way that we can defeat evil is if evil doesn't exist. And that's not biblical. You can legislate all you want, you're not going to change hearts. And if you are overwhelmed by a world that is rampant with evil, and that prevents you from being an overcomer, you're missing the point. Regardless of what's going on around you, you defeat this evil world. How do you do that? Because you don't let it affect the way you live. You don't let it get, to, get you to a point where you just move to a mountain, turn in your cell phone, and grow vegetables. Because there's nothing in here that tells us to do that. Now, we have to be on guard. That's what this whole, ser- this whole series is about, recognizing the false. But if the false keeps you from being what God makes you to be, then you're defeated. And the one who was with Christ When he gave his life on Calvary, he says, every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. Don't you see it? There's There's like parallel universes going on here. There's what's going on in the physical, and there's what's going on in the spiritual. And we are spiritual beings working in physical bodies. God has created in us the ability to overcome anything that the world wants to throw against us. And if we tell us ourselves that we are defeated, then we're not doing anything for His honor and for His glory. Regardless of what other people say, regardless of what people say about you, regardless of of the the naysayers that, that tell you it's all over, if you get to a point where you can't accept this verse, now there's a difference between not accepting it and not quite achieving it, okay? I get it. But if you get to a point where you say, there's no hope, there's nothing that I can do, that the only way that I will feel like I've overcome evil is if I don't see it, man, Satan has you right where he wants you. We are made to live overcoming lives. Now take a deep breath. Let's come back to this. The world's view of what a child of God should be like is exactly what hinders every child of God from keeping God's commandments. The world's view of what you should be like, if you accept that and try to conform to it, then that's exactly what's going to keep you from fulfilling what God has told us to do. There has to be a time where you're willing to stand alone. And we don't have to be caustic with that. Lord knows there have been plenty coming out of the church that have given God a bad name by demeaning people and by devaluing them and by calling them names and all of these awful things. But there is a time to take a stand. I will not accept that because it's against the Word of God. There are many people who will just want you to say, look, you're no different than me. People can't change. Ever hear that? People don't change. You ever hear that from a Christian? I want you to challenge that. If you claim to be a believer and you say people can't change, there's a problem. Because that's exactly what he does. He, he transforms us into new creations, right? Maybe we get some people to say, who do you think you are? You think you're better than me? 
just a goody goody, right? Well, the fact is, misery loves company. Yeah. And there are plenty of people that will say, Come keep me company. Yeah. We need to show them something greater. We need to show them a, a, a reaction that doesn't match the world's reaction. A reaction to the pressure that is put upon us that comes back in a totally different fashion that shows itself in love. There are plenty of people out there who will redefine sin. God doesn't care if you go out and get drunk. God doesn't care if you cuss like a sailor. God doesn't care if you have an adulterous affair. God doesn't care if you identify as a cat. God doesn't care <laughs> if you live a homosexual lifestyle. And none of those people do I hate. None of those people does God hate. Right. Yeah. But there's a line in the sand that we have to say we have a biblical worldview. Right. Yeah. And this is not godly. A transformed child of God does not let the world dictate what is right and what is wrong. You cannot be swayed by emotions because emotions are fickle. You, you can have a cup of coffee, you have, were a grouch, but now you've got some caffeine and you can actually talk to somebody. Uh, you, can, you can be hot and sweaty and have a lousy attitude, or you can come in an air-conditioned room and feel better. So emotions are fleeting, emotions are fickle. Emotions cannot make you choose what to base your life on. Human logic and reasoning. The people that had pulled out of the church that John is writing against back in the end of the first century were saying, I'm trusting my logic and reasoning. Not stopping to think that the one who created their ability for logic and reasoning is the one that sent Jesus fully God and fully man. That he lived in the flesh that he was tempted in the flesh, that he died, and that he rose again. I thank God for intellect and reasoning. We don't have to check our brains when we come into church. God wants us to research and read, and, and knowledge is a good thing, but when we elevate that above God, we've got a problem. And the other thing that causes people to just not understand why children of God live differently than the world is the flesh wants what the flesh wants. And the flesh will do whatever it has to do to get what it wants. And that's why we have been given through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit the, the position where we can tell our flesh, get in line. The child of God resists the rationale of the world by faith in Christ. And the fact that the child of God is a different animal than the animal of the world. It may not always feel like it. But like the song says, and that comes from this verse of Scripture, uh, I think it's still in our, I think it's in our hymn, though. We have those yet, don't we? They're up there. Yeah, we sing hymns. But uh, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That comes from this verse, by faith. Some things make no earthly sense. Some things we don't understand. We think of miraculous healing, miraculous provision. The way that God orders things, it makes no earthly sense. You could not have planned that to come out like that, but God did. Amen. It's faith in God and not faith in yourself. It's not faith in our intellect, in our social status, in our bank account, in our family lineage, in our talents, our good looks, our talents, our good works, and all those kind of things. But through faith in what you already know about the character and nature of God. And there's not one person here that knows everything about the character and nature of God. Because to, every time you go through a struggle, every time you go through a trial, every time you go through a, a mountain that's in your way, and you persevere and press through, you learn more about the character and nature of God. Walk by faith in what you know. You can't walk in what you don't know. But it's still faith. We still walk by faith and not by sight. We can't wait until we graduate to heaven to, to walk in this overcoming attitude. Because when you get to heaven, we're not going to need faith. Because it's all going to be sight. We're going to touch it, see it, answers to all of these questions. And that's something to look forward to, right? An eternity in His presence, absolutely. But we can't make it all about that. 
and think that that's when the overcoming happens. The overcoming happens right now, especially in your lowest place, especially when you've got the diagnosis from the doctor that you didn't want to hear, especially when you're hurting, your heart's hurting over your kids, your grandkids, especially when you get $2.37 to your name. That's when faith comes into play. Romans 8, 24 says, who hopes for what he doesn't have, right? Faith is when we hope and what we don't yet have, but we know we will. The Apostle Paul prayed for the Colossian Christians that the Lord would continue to, continue to give knowledge and understanding through the Holy Spirit. He said, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. So to, no matter where you are in your walk with Jesus, no matter where you're at in that life's racetrack, there's overcoming for the child of God. This is a good verse to put on an index card or something that you can see it all the time. Every child of God, your child of God, every, then you're in the every, every child of God defeats this evil world. And we achieve this victory through our faith. We achieve the victory through what we cannot see, touch, taste, hear, or smell. It's through faith. Not in our own uh, abilities, but faith in God. Is this only for a lucky few? Is this only for professional clergy? Is this only for missionaries? No. Every child of God. Now we're coming around turn four toward the start finish line, and we got verse five. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And you see how we're back where we started? This whole letter of 1 John is about understanding who Jesus is. It's only available to those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So for those that are placing all their faith in their intellect and in their superior knowledge and in all of the things that they've been able to achieve on their own, they don't win this battle. Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. What does it mean to be the Son of God? It means that He is completely God and completely man. That He is completely divine, yet walked in flesh. Why is that important? Because He had to be subject to all of the temptation and strife and emotions that we are, yet without sin. Yet He gave Himself willingly by physically dying on a cross, to pay sin's penalty once and for all. Do you know that when Jesus died on the cross, that atoning work provided for forgiveness of sin for those who died anticipating Christ, and it paid for sin for those who would be yet to come. Mm -hmm. yes. That in God's perfect timing, He completed His plan that He knew we were going to need from before the foundation of the world. That's a mighty God. That's a mighty God whose love and mercy could not change his own rules about how he looked upon sin. Well, if God is so loving, why doesn't he just forgive everybody? Because God is God. <laughs> he did not create evil. Evil came from the extension of free will, which was obviously extended to the angels as well. For God to be God, he had to extend the, the choice. So a loving God does not send people to hell. Come on, amen. That's right. They go willingly. Yep. Yep. That's right. From the very beginning, before Adam and Eve walked the earth, God had a plan. And the plan was Jesus. Believe Love, overcome, and repeat. And every time you go around the track, every time you repeat the cycle, you will have grown up a little bit more in Christ. The things that seem so difficult for you the first time around, the next time around you go, oh, yeah, God gave me overcoming. Don't you? Isn't that the way it goes? 
we're about to be grandparents here in November, first time, and, and we think about our son and daughter, you know, of our son and daughter-in-law, that, you know, they're going to have this baby, and they're not going to instantly know everything to do. Of course, we're going to act like we do. But <laughs> they're not going to know everything to do, but they're going to learn, and then when they come around the track again, if they have another one, you know, and they're going to have learned something. That's the same way it is as we go through this life and we experience the, the truth of what this Scripture has to say. Because you've allowed God to prove Himself in your life. You've taken Him at His word. Amen? What's the race all about? Is this race about getting everything you want? Is this race about getting all the goodies? Is this race about naming and claiming all that? No, not at all. The race is about learning to be like Jesus. And unlike racing a car around a track, this journey is less dependent on your skills as it is your willingness to let God have full control. And we practiced that this morning. And I want to practice it again before we leave. I think it's fair to say that most of us, when we consider this whole idea of going around the track and facing obstacles and learning to overcome the world and growing more like Jesus. There are times where we don't feel too victorious. There are times where we're tempted to, to go backwards. If I could just back up and just rest for a while. But you know, it's in that, it's in that pursuing God it's in that pursuit that the miraculous happens. It's in that not knowing, but yet being willing to say, here I am. That's where the victory happens. That's where the growth happens. That's where you start to understand God's character and nature just a little bit more. So I want us to close today. I want to challenge you in a few areas. Before you can get in the car and leave the start-finish line, you need to be changed. We need to be born again. What does that mean? It means we give God permission to change us. Because there's no way that we have the skills necessary to even start the race on our own. We won't make it to the first turn. We'll have a blowout. It just will not work. So we come to the end of ourselves and we say, Jesus, I believe that you died for me and that you live again and that you're coming back. And I don't understand how you're going to do it, but I just want you to change me into the kind of a person that can pursue you that can pursue righteousness, that can pursue holiness. And we call that the born-again experience because of our own will, we choose Jesus, and the Holy Spirit comes and makes a change in us, and it makes us into new people, and He begins that work of sanctification that lasts our entire life, that is looking less like the world and more like Jesus. It's instant, but yet it's a lifelong experience we have as we keep making laps around the track. And perhaps maybe you got to a certain point and you decided just to hang out, watch other people go by, but you realize that the victory is in the, the risk. The victory is in the risk. God, I don't understand it, but I'm going to step forward just a little bit more. I'm going to step just a little bit deeper in the water of your spirit. I want to step just a little bit further in faith, not knowing what's going to happen, and that may be you today. And you can say, yes, Lord, I'm not going to hold back anymore. That's why we used the illustration earlier. Do something that you've never done before in worship because that correlates to how you live your life. Oh, I could never raise my hands in worship. I grew up a German Methodist, and we didn't do that. And, and now it's so hard for me to even speak English when I'm worshiping the Lord because of what He's changed me. It doesn't mean that my personality is gone. I can still be a reserved frugal German, but, 
but when he sets you free, and when you, when you, and so, so it's not just raising your hands or shouting or, or having a heavenly, heavenly language with which to pray. Sometimes it's not even anything emotional. It's just simply, I'm putting myself out there. And I want to challenge you even further to do that today as we come to this time of decision. What's God speaking to you today? What's he challenging you to do? Is he challenging you to let go of your understanding and trust his? Is he challenging you to say yes to something that you can't shake, that it's back in here and you think, oh, that could never be me. Maybe he's waiting for you to say, okay, that may be. Whatever it may be, will you let him do that today?